this time the, the topic of having navigated or percutaneous fixation of pelvic estabular injuries and in this uh, i'll be the moderator and dr hasani will be with me as the another moderator and we have got one of the best faculty around we have got roman from switzerland we have got still from uh, geneva in usa and we will be and i'll be giving the third talk so we will be able to take every part of this percutaneous minimally invasive surgery in it, its respects so i'll first uh, request the, dr roman to talk about the implications what we have with the minimally invasive work up on the pelvic stable trauma to roman please thank you very much for this introduction so can you see my presentation is it yeah that's right i would basically cover only the technical aspects um of percutaneous techniques and also cover a little bit the navigation system later the experts are going probably de deeper into the details and explain and uh, describe the um the experience of this uh, surgical techniques in our in the daily practice so my content is mainly why do we need minimal invasive techniques in um, pelvic surgery what are the percutaneous techniques uh, what are the screw pathways and of course uh, what is the navigation what are, what kind of navigation techniques do do we have for only 15 minutes try to put everything together in a this short period of time <clears throat> why uh, minimal invasive surgery of course our main goal is to achieve adequate stability by limiting surgic, uh, surgical uh, trauma and usually in our department we use uh, minimal invasive techniques usually in geriatric patients who have who have um, um, less physiological reserve and in this patient we try to be less invasive to avoid <clears throat> infections to avoid severe bleeding and tissue trauma this this is uh, i would say our main main strategy in geriatric population another main indication in our hospital is a um, severely injured patient so this space this patient we also try to avoid a uh, severe second hit which is usually associated with very very invasive surgical interventions and that's why this patient try to stabilize the pelvis and um, as fast as possible with minimal invasive techniques to, to allow early mobilization of these patients. Of course, our main uh, main aim is a reduction um, of the fracture, and this is also one must must be one of the important factors in the decision making. Probably later we can discuss exactly what are the indications for minimal invasive techniques uh, according to the fracture morphology, and uh, probably the experts get also their opinion. Into it and um, special equipment and imaging plays <clears throat> I feel an important role as well. So percutaneous techniques here, um, it's uh, according to my point of view, very important aspect is uh, the radio radio um, radiographic view uh, views of radiographic views and the intraoperative um, radiographic views of the pelvis, which allows you to ident the identification of the right and safe uh, trajectory. Um, for the stabilization of the pelvis. And you see on the right side a list of different uh, views. We all go um, very fast over all these views, but um, actually um, in, it's in this short time, it's very difficult to understand probably all these views. Probably it's better if you're interested in this topic that you have a good book or this uh, nice summary in this review to uh, which shows you the description, all these views and explains you the... Um, this, uh, the steps. So um, initially, we are going to speak about transsacral or iliosacral fixation, and usually you need this fixation in, in any time of uh, pathological pathologies in, a, in the posterior pel pelvic ring. Usually, this in our cases are uh, um, um, osteoporotic pelvic ring fractures, but of course also as eye joint ruptures in um, more high energy trauma patients. And uh, usually, you need. Um, in this main two views in the inlet and the outlet view of the pelvis. But in the inlet out <clears throat> view, which is um, very important that you do the right way. And um, in this um, in this view, you need to and you need to prove that as one 
is over the S2 position, then radiologically, that um, this situation, you can, if you place your screw or your guide wire in the middle of the bone, like it's shown here, so you can exclude or avoid any damage here in the front of the vessels or um, important nervous structures, similarly also in the back, which also not so easy to see in this view as well. Um, outpa um, outlet view, it's very important to that um, your, your symphysis is around of the level of S2, like it's shown here. And then in this, this way, you can, um, you can see the right position here on the, uh, like it's shown here on the screw or the guide wires in S1 and S2, and um, avoid here the um, movement of the screw out of the bone or into the uh, into the foramen of the nervous structures. <clears throat> These are the radiological ex examples here from uh, um, screw placement in S1 and the outlet and inlet view. And you see here, if you position your screw more um, more cranial here or more to the front, there are a few descriptions in a, a new publication described in some um, dysmorphic uh, sacral bones, you have a chance here to damage L5, which is that why you need to add them, you need to have a good radiological views and you need to place it in um, um, more central if possible here to avoid any any further damages of uh, relevant structures. Another, um, to my point of view, relevant uh, um, pathway is the anterior columns, uh, column screw pathway. You usually use them for fractures of anterior pelvic ring for ramus fractures, or use it for um, uh, anterior column fractures. And uh, um, you need, in general, this two views. One, one view is uh, um, the obturator um, outlet view, like it's shown here, and iliac inlet view, it's like a, the opposite of it. With this view, you can include that your, your wire is um, within the joint, or you're, um, you're inside of the pelvis here. And so, of course, it's also a risk of damage um, of vascular structures which go to the lower extremity. You can uh, position um, the screws in a, an anterograde and retrograde um, way. And uh, so, depending, depending on the um, type of fracture. Another view is, uh, like I told you before, is the iliac inlet view, which like 90 degrees, the opposite of the rest. Here you can exclude the positioning of the screw um, too anteriorly or too posteriorly, which of course is very dangerous here. And, um, and can, um, uh, especially in the pelvis, uh, can, uh, the um, um, organs of the smaller pelvis can be injured here if you position it too medially. These are some clinical pictures. Again, you see this was an uh, anterograde position of the screw. The fracture <clears throat> is, um, is um, here, the upper, upper ramus on the right side. Um, you might probably uh, put the screw much more deeper according to this radiological view, but you see you're outside of the joint, you're inside the bone of both sides. So this is a safe placement, but uh, you can also put it in a um, retrograde way and also stabilize um, the fracture as well. <clears throat> the, next, the next screw is a posterior column screw. And um, you need here both views. One view is an anterior posterior view. And the second is the, this oblique um, iliac view, which shows, shows you the posterior column of the acetabulum. This is like, um, this is a um, this is a demonstration of the mo model. And here's a radiological view. And what, like you see here, you need to open a window here of the pelvic crest and uh, of the ilium and uh, mobilize the musculature. And then you can go in the direction of the ischium, of the, of the ischium of, uh, and uh, position your screw in the direction um, of, um, um, like I told you, on the ischium in an in a, in a antigrad way. This is a publication of Sir Mafre, which demonstrates a retrograde positioning of the screw as well. Of course, it's, uh, both approaches have uh, their own risk. Risk is a retrograde approach. So it's also in, in the reviews demonstrate there's a risk of uh, infections, but also a so risk of uh, damage of nervous structures, especially in um, ischial nerves or 
vascular structures of um, gluteus uh, muscle. So another um, um, working force, I would say, is a LC2 screw. Um, usually you use it for positioning of uh, external fixation in the pelvis, supratable external fixation of the pelvis. You use them for, pla uh, for placement of pedicle screws of uh, infix, um, 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 uh, infix screws. And of course, you can use it for fixation of larger um, column, anterior column fractures or larger wing fractures. So this screw usually goes through, through, um, through a good bone, um, um, good bone pass, pathway, which is very, very strong. And, and this is a very long screw usually and allows a good stabilization here in this area. And usually you have uh, two main standard um, 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 views, radiological views. So you have this iliac oblique view where you can, uh, um, where you can position, um, where you can start to position the, um, the placement of this wire, of the wire. And then you have this iliac, iliac view where you, you can exclude that your wire goes not, not to the medial part of the pelvis or it goes out, outward. And, um, after placing or moving in, inward, you can even uh, perform this ILIC view and exclude that the sciatic notch is damaged here or injured uh, with this, uh, with this uh, screw. And uh, this is actually also a very good way to stabilize um, 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 pelvic ring injuries and have a good stability with a long fixation. And then we are going to speak about magic screws. Um, I never use it to, to be honest. Probably we can discuss later with expert whether what how what kind of experience do they have with this screw, and um, and uh, this uh, starting point here is similar to the um, anterior column screw. But after positioning the, in the entry entry point, you're usually heading in the direction of ischial e spine. It's here from this point of view, and we have a radiological imaging from AP. We see the ischial spine is here in this direction. And <clears throat> you can change your view to the iliac, uh, oblique iliac view again. You see the, uh, um, the spine and it goes into the direction um, into, this, um, into this area. Usually you use it for the fixation of uh, quadrilateral plates after reposition to keep the reposition fixed with this, with this screw. This, uh, since I have no, uh, never done this, uh, um, uh, this screw positioning before, I found just a couple of um, nice pictures, uh, I would say here from the internet, which demonstrated even in transverse fractures, it was here described. And here, the position is not nice, but still two screws were, were placed in a similar manner. However, in the final, in some situations, probably agree if you have uh, um, patients with, uh, which are very obese, which have patients have, which have uh, several pathologies like uh, pathological fractures, uh, very difficult uh, and, um, dislocations or abnormalities. Then in this patient and a normal or uh, standard views are very difficult. Um, even if you, if you um, use it very often, you, you have difficulties to put the uh, in placement use um, of your screws. That's why in our hospital we have established uh, different, different navigation techniques. And um, as we, we know, it's um, also in a dysmorphic pelvis, there's also high risk to damage all those different structures, um, vascular structure, nerval structures. And, um, and they, uh, we have published um, a couple of years ago, um, one of our first studies is a percutaneous fixation of SI screws and after placing of 30 in 38 patients, we found that even, even if you use a standard radiological devices, radiological devices and radiological use, you have an L, almost 10% of the patients screw malpositioning and 5% and of nerval lesions. And that's why, especially in this morphic screws, or you have patients with the pathological uh, um, changes or um, due to tumors, or even uh, pre-operated patients already, then you, we, just, we usually use a navigator's navigation system. So you, uh, in this case, you have a patient here in the front on the operation table, and you have different monitors where you can use navigation uh, and uh, all this um, 
um, you can uh, play like it was a computer to, and, and establish your own setup, and then you need to ARM or interoperative CT scanner uh, for uh, for this um, navigation system. I would like to show you just a very short a clinical case which demonstrates you how we proceed. So this is a 90 year, year so male patient, very old and um, more in um, several diseases, and but he has a severe more severe pain in the pelvis after a fall is a, due to a bilateral sacral fractures, and um, this patient is, is immobile, and um, we decided to offer this patient you no know, stabilization of the posterior pelvic ring, but uh, this patient had a. Uh, already a stabilization before in his history, spinal pelvic fixation, you see the fractures go directly here through this, uh, along the screws and um, cause a severe pain. And uh, so in this 90-year patient, we did not decide to remove all the implants or change the posterior to fixation, but this, our idea was to uh, fix it, to have it like transsexual fixation and this pelvic Posterior pelvic ring, what probably you imagine, it's not so easy in the geriatric patient with a fixation yet to, to find a good pathway. That's why what we usually is usually you, you don't need so many um, surgical instruments here. You need a detector here, what you can place here on the um, on the on, on the ilium here on, on the right side, for example. You need a detector with a universal guide and uh, different. Um, uh, guide wires, and um, after a CT scan, for example, this is yes, this is a guide and detectors for for a worm, and this is four dots detecting the ilium and, and and the patient. And after the CT scan of the patient, you have uh, this is a T scan. You have the possibility. I show you some pictures later. You have the possibility to place. You, you screw or, or first, for example, here and, and guide wires and then um, according to the navigation system. So this is a contralateral side. And so you see, for example, this is the same patient, 90 years old, and you see the screws. This was on the right side. We placed here 6.5 millimeter screw with 100, more or less 100 millimeters of length. That was the right side. On the left side, the screw, screw was positioned a little bit different. And... Uh, Initially, we usually use the guide wires and then control it with a CT scan. And if we're happy with the result, after that, <clears throat> we can use the screws to position it in the right way. And uh, this is the final result after the surgery. And this is the result um, after the mobilization of the patient and um, without any complications. So, um, in general, so, and the studies demonstrate if you have a dysmorphic uh, sacra. And they use a 3D navigation um, uh, systems. You have a misplacement of zero percent, even in the normal. Um, of course, in the normal sacra, you have the same um, zero percent of misplace. This is a good way to position screws in the right way without them uh, to reduce complication rates in the patients. Similarly, it's also with uh, if you have a team which knows um, how to work this uh, navigation system, so operation times are similar according to the study in our hospital is the same. And you can even reduce radi radiation time for medical personal surgeons and also nurses in operation room since uh, you avoid um, this extensive um, radiological, um, um, radiological examinations. So in conclusion, of course, our main goal is, achieve, is to achieve adequate stability and to limit surgical trauma, but we need to keep in mind the right indication, the reduction is still the most important step. We need to know all the radiological, uh, radiographic uh, views. I think um, you, you need to have like a good guides to understand all this radiographic use of what are advantages and disadvantages of each of each view. But of course, computer assisted techniques can help you if you have the possibility. You can place your screws in a safe manner. The operation time is always the same as you have a good teach um, uh, team and um, you can even reduce radiation for patients and surgeon, but you need to consider, of course, higher cost. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Roman. I think we had a uh, very well made out base for the subsequent two talks. 
So I'll be taking up the issue of managing the pelvic injuries in these cases. And subsequently, we will have a talk on the stubborn fracture. So I'll be talking about percutaneous fixation, the indications and the technique in fractures. As we expect and as has been talked about, that we are likely to be dealing with fractures around the pelvis anteriorly, sidewise and posteriorly, depending on the fracture morphology. But we must perceive a fact that if the fracture is displaced, it requires reduction also. So how a reduction can be obtained and how subsequent stabilization is to be done. In low velocity injuries, most of these cases may not be displaced, but in relatively high velocity injuries, reduction is the main thing. Now, in this reduction, in contrast to the sternum fracture, where there is an articular area which needs anatomical reconstruction, the difference in pelvis is that we may not be anatomical, we can be near anatomical. And further, it may not be that whole reduction and fixation has to be minimally invasive. It can be a complement to whatever is with the open approach. So it may not be totally an open reduction. So when we look at the corridors for the placement of the osseous fixation, so-called OFPs also, that there are defined corridors around in the pelvic bone, around the estabulum and around the pelvis. And an important fact is the size of these pathways may differ depending on the iliac morphology, depending on a male pelvis and a female pelvis. They may correlate, may not be absolutely predictive for a particular level, but they so right now I am picking up these three corridors, the iliosacral corridor, the LC2 corridors and the pubic remi corridors, which are the main corridors. Starting from the LC2 corridor, Roman has already told about the situation in which we can get a stability across, so typically named for the LC2 injuries, where we can have a stability between anterior and posterior part. And we do have that definitions of an entry point over there, which is a kind of a um, eye over there through which we will have in an oblique position of the pelvis. And in this position, we can have a, which is called a combined operator oblique outlet view with a teardrop. So in which we can get to see the most dense part where the fixation is likely to give us a very strong stability. And in this stability, which goes from anterior inferior spine backwards toward the posterior superior, posterior inferior spine. So this is the strongest area, strongest corridor fixation, which can be there. It could be used for these simple kind of a fracture, the percutis. We just have to pass a screw around that area going backwards. Or it could be like this situation where the patient had a pelvic trauma along with the vascular injury, along with the collateral formations where we wanted to avoid opening of the area. So we just put a fixator, we close the pelvis and then we put our screws into LC2 corridors to support it area. There could be other way around that we can go from retrograde way also. And this also has been found to be useful in crescent fractures where we can have a stability within the same corridor. We go from back to forward and it is supposed that in this corridor, we have got a good strength and we do not injure most of the soft tissues around. Now, there has been a recent work on the difference between male and female uh, bones. It has been found that this corridor could be a little tricky in a female patient where the morphology may not be very thick. So it is suggested by the authors here that Rather than going a standard way, we could tilt it a bit that starting from little low and going little upwards may be an appropriate corridor rather than the classical, which is there in the male patients. The another corridor we often use the anterior column. In this case, in a pelvic area, we call it a pubic remi. And in this, we understand that this pubic remi has got a different level of anatomical alterations. 
and we need to find out a place to go for stabilization of the pubic rim eye fractures. Very often we use Nakatani classification which divides this area into three zone 1, zone 2 and zone 3 part for the fracture uh, to happen there so, and accordingly the fixation has to be done. This we need to do in a supine position, we can use a K wire and then in the central and coronal plane we watch it and then we can check it up and for its progression. Just for an example in this patient we can see a displaced pubic fracture and what do we do? Now we need to reduce it out. So for the reduction the point of entry will always be on the opposite side of the pubic surfaces at the skin level at the bone level just below the pubic tubercle we make an entry now here we, you can we can use a sleeve to hold that fragment the the entry part of it and with that fragment we can manipulate this fragment to get into alignment with the uh, rest of the fragment and once it is there with the minimal manipulation we get into the proxy uh, this uh, fragment and then pass our k wire once the wire is passed subsequently we can take it out and over this we can drill it or we can put a self drilling uh, screw across the uh, rim eye and this kind of a fixation is likely to give ideally speaking this length of the screw has to be little more but there is always a danger that we might reach to the joint or entry into the joint Another say, case with a similar kind of a situation but the manipulation was not much required as the fracture was not much displaced and here again we could get over. Another situation where we did most of these configurations could permit us percutaneous fixation all these fractures. So here also we have a guide wire, we test it in the different position of operator oblique and inlet view and once we are in it, once our sleeve is there, we get the wire inside it and then we can put a screw to give us a reasonable amount of a outcome subsequently. Now, there is a study which has just published last month which says that uh, they have looked at the strength of a screw vis-a-vis -vis this uh, compression screw. They found that headless compression screws have got a better purchase. Now, the main corridor which we mostly used and which is a kind of an essential in the management of pelvic fractures is the posterior fixation, where is the iliosacral corridor in which we again further differentiate whether we are doing it for a sacrum fracture or we are doing it for a sacral dislocation. For a sacrum fracture, we need to be really transversely going from one side to the another side ella. While in a sacral dislocation, we will be navigating anteriorly to reach the body. So that way to these to differ and their difference is particularly to the level at which we have to have the stability. Sacroiliac joint is obliquely placed, so our this screw is obliquely pointing towards the uh, body and while the sacrum fracture is more into the alignment to get over to the other side and that is the way. So this is the kind of the spectrum we can see the difference between the sacrum fracture and sacroiliac dislocation. Now once we are there as Dr. Roman just talked about it that we have got a lot of neurovascular structures around. So our area of transgression has to be very well defined because we know in the sacrum there is an area which we see on which their neurovascular structures especially the narrow roots are there and we want to avoid it. The second perspective we always carry that if you are doing an open reduction and then doing a screw you are very close to the bone from the entry point and your target corridor is defined. But when you are entering from the skin level, now your target, uh, this target corridor has to be still defined and that requires a lot of specification and lot of check and balances so that the anteriorly structure, the neurovascular structures are not injured. And for that we need good amount of imaging, both inlet view, outlet view along with an AP view. But there does exist because this being an indefinite anatomy, especially in 15 to 50 percent, many times there is very common this dysmorphism which has to be seen and these cases need to be really evaluated. We can do this thing in a prone position or we can put iliosacral screw in the supine position. We feel more comfortable in supine because it's more 
for a patient's physiology is okay, anesthesia people are okay, reduction capabilities do exist there. The disadvantage is that if you have to shift to, to open reduction, it is not possible. Because in supine position, you can give attraction, you can do even the manipulation on the iliac wings also, if you want to manipulate, bring them together, and this way you can get. The entry point roughly is at a point, but we always check through the lateral view. Again, looking at a case scenario, here is a case with a sacrum fracture along with the pubic rim. I fracture here for the sacrum fracture, we tend to take the images in let view and we tend to see the reduction, the positioning of the patient accordingly. And then we keep the outlet view. Again, we check over the outlet view whether the things are reduced or not the foramina. Then basically we start with the lateral view. In the lateral view, once the patient has been properly placed with a little elevation in that area, so we in the lateral view, we try to look at the sacrum, trying to define the intensity, the cortical density over here, and avoiding this area because here we are likely to be out. So our area will lie somewhere around into the area just below the cortical density and there we try to pick up a point of entry. This is the entry point, we widen it a bit and thereafter put our guide wire over there and then we come over to the inlet and outlet. So gradually going from inlet to outlet, we get the uh, transmission of our wire across towards the opposite side and once it is done, we can put a screw. Now, if we want to put a, another screw, we tend to put it in the S2 level and again defining the same corridor, we go through across to the S2 parameters. And this makes a reasonable amount of stability and this is the at, at six weeks partial weight bearing and this comes to be a kind of a normal walking at the level of a six months of uh, outcome in this kind of a situation. The, another case which was an injury by a hand gliding accident where the both sides were affected, we did a both side fixation and we do check it up after the post-operative CT scan whether we have got anywhere inside or we have uh, by accidentally come outside also. So CT scan does tell us about the event of this thing. But most of these cases usually need two fixations but if the displacement is not significant, sometimes we can manage with one also when we are combining it with anterior fixations, but all these vertical instabilities must be stabilized with adequate strength. So you will need S1 and S2 stabilization. Another case with the same kind of a situation where we put a screw posteriorly and a screw and a plate anteriorly. Once it is done, we remove one of the guiding wire from the PBRMI and we have a fixation both front and back and this is the outcome. And this is the outcome at two years of the follow-up of that patient. Another case with the sacroiliac disruption on one side and a sacrum on the other side was a patient who has got the similar kind of a situation here. We needed to stabilize one an oblique screw and one in direct screw in a transverse for the sacrum fracture along with the pubic remi fixations anteriorly and this is the subsequent outcome of this patient. Now it could be an important uh, situation in a moral level like kind of a lesion where you need to have the fixation done. So here you take care primarily for the lesion and subsequently you can do the percutaneous fixation in this kind of a situation and here that uh, is done again we go for the fixation at two level, at S1 level, as S2 level, by defining in the lateral view, then getting over to the fixation. And this is subsequently at nine months follow-up. The only problem which still remained is a kind of a bogey swelling where there was a moral level lesion in this case. Otherwise, the girl doesn't have any other problem. This is also important in a polytrauma kind of a situation where multiple injuries really require a stability of the pelvis also. So here this was the case with the injury pelvis, injury femur, injury leg and in this situation the first part was stabilization of the pelvis by X-fix and stabilization of the femur. And after this once the patient settled hemodynamically we went for uh, this fixation of the uh, iliosacral from the both the sides of uh, the uh, pelvis as such. Now what is to be avoided in this fixation is this is, our screw should never enter into the canal or it should not come anteriorly. These are the things. 
and now it was told by Rohan also now we have got more of these uh, osteoporotic fractures also where for the stability you need a specifically the long screws when you look at the outcome most of the authors do say that they have a good outcome but there is always a chance of neurological or vascular deficit and second displacements this other paper also describes the various author telling about but there does remain problems also the accuracy is very very important but in spite with the second 2d fluoroscopy guidance there is a percentage of complications which have been happening and which can be evaluated either by the complaint or the symptom or the post operative ct and very important to avoid one of the factor is to look out for sacral dysmorphism which is not uncommon in most of these cases for being safer there is a technique called hammering technique there are many things described or you can have a navigation but in this case also it is said that if your uh, this bend if your guide wire bends 7.7 cm in a depth maybe our navigation may not be able to really tell us more about it but definitely it has been an advantage to use a navigation in all those situations orm has got its own advantages and then there is a controversy between the crm navigation and orm navigation every every part has got its own plus and minuses depending upon the experience we have got incidentally there has been a report of using this 3d printed external template also for percutaneous fixation and people might find this to be a kind of a way to go in for maybe in the time so what we understand is that this kind of a surgery of minimal invasiveness and doing percutaneous fixation for the pelvis definitely has advantages definitely had a chance of getting uh, errors and affecting it but if we are able to have a detailed preoperative workup if we meet the criteria of understanding the anatomy well we appreciate the injury we appreciate that we need to avoid intraoperative calculation miscalculations we have a proper radiological interpretation we are aware of any variation in the anatomy and if we fulfill all these criteria then decent morphological and clinical result can be obtained because after all this is one surgery where infection rate is least the patient get less pain good function and is able to return to work very well in time thank you thank you professor ramesh thank you and uh thank you for sharing us your long time experience and as you told us you are doing more than 15 courses per year on life ca on cadavers yeah. so um i now invite uh, uh, professor cyril mafre uh that he is a director of department of orthopedic in denver health and uh is specialized in management of complex trauma of pelvis in the stabulum and also for the joint replacement but today i will ask uh, you dr marfrey to uh, show us what you are doing in a stabular surgery percutaneously with or without navigation so welcome the floor is yours thank you uh can everyone see my uh, screen yes excellent yes. Uh so I'm Cyril Mafri uh I'm from uh, Denver I'm from France actually but I I live in Denver and work in Denver um and I'm going to talk about uh some techniques around acetabular fixation um and the key thing to this topic unfortunately uh it's really uh, tough to do this in 15 minutes but I have a lot of stuff that's already published online if you go on my website it's actually free it's a website that I designed specifically for pelvis and acetabular fracture it's called theorthoacademy.com you could see it on the bottom right there uh not only is there um a, a lot of information uh probably at this stage the most valuable information is a series of drawings that I did around uh the x-rays that is the most complicated part of this that you will require to understand um how to do percutaneous uh, pelvic and acetabular fractures you you have the drawings for each views and you also have how to get those x-rays where should you move your c arm in which direction and i think that this is very useful and you can download the pdf there's no cost and you can learn a lot 
and it'll help you um, to do those surgeries. I'm going to show you a few um, indications, uh, standard techniques, and then more importantly, I wanted to show some alternative applications uh, that I find uh, interesting um, and that perhaps uh, can help you in your practices. This is a very classic case, nothing special, but nevertheless, uh, more and more common in today's world uh, because we're dealing more with geriatric uh, fractures. We don't see many at Denver Health. Our population is young and high energy injuries, but we do see those. Um, and you can see this is a pretty innocuous uh, looking fracture. But if you get the CT scan, you can see a, a fragility fracture um, in the medial to lateral plane um, that requires, um, can be treated non-surgically, but yet again, this is like a hip fracture, uh, that patient would have to be immobilized and would probably, um, develop complications, uh, such as pressure sores and chest infections. So we're fairly aggressive in the management of these injuries. Um, this is the tools that I use, um, for any pelvis, uh, fractures, but specifically for, uh, percutaneous. I use what's called a pig sticker, which is a broken cannulated screwdriver that is beveled real sharp. This is very useful for an anti-grade anterior column fracture and an anti-grade posterior column fracture where the angles of entry are very steep. And it's nice to have a sharp instrument that holds your wire through the soft tissues. Uh, I also use a drill tip guide, not a threaded tip guide. Because with a threaded tip, you do not have proprioception, and it's very difficult to change the direction of the threaded uh, tip. So uh, drill better than threaded tip. And then finally, I don't show it here, but what's very useful, especially at the beginning, is a parallel guide. So your, screw, your wire is aiming in the great direction, but it's a little too either cephalad or codded, and therefore you use that wire to guide a wire in any direction parallel to it. It's called a parallel guide, and that can get you out of trouble um, and save you 30 minutes in any percutaneous screw that you want to perform. Um, for this uh, case that I showed you earlier, you, you will remember that the fracture was from the medial to the lateral plane, which means that a screw uh, that would be efficiently capturing that fracture would be, for example, an LC2 screw. You saw Ramesh's uh, talk on this earlier. Um, it's very hard to get the entry point of a LC2 screw with the x-ray. That The textbook tells you that the entry point is determined on an obturator outlet. I, I disagree with this statement. And, and in fact, we published a paper with Peter Genudis on uh, the fact that this view is not useful when you, when you do a femoral nail, you don't get a view of the tunnel of the femur to get your entry point. You get two orthogonal views, right? And this is exactly the same. Therefore, the obturator outlet that is used for supraacetabular screws or LC2 is not useful. It's actually in your way. You can see me struggling here on the top left picture that you have your hands and the wire and the x-ray right in the way. So it, I don't use it. The first view that I use is an iliac oblique. It's like using a lateral view for a, a retrograde femoral nail. If you're on the bone on that lateral view, you are on the bone. You're right on the AIIS. And then the second view is an inlet obturator view. And I'll show you here. This is our publication from several years ago where we kind of demonstrated why that obturator outlet is really not useful at all. Um, so those are the two views that are used. The first view there is the obturator outlet. It makes sure that you are within the inner and the outer table of the pelvis to do either an LC2, retrograde LC2, a supraacetabular external fixation. It's exactly the same view, exactly the same technique. This is what we did for this patient. Simple LC2 screw, uh, good purchase. Fully threaded or partially threaded makes zero difference. People say you can't use a fully threaded if it's a comminution, you know, if you can use a partially threaded, if it's a comminuted S2 sacrum, you will also get compression with a fully threaded screw. So it gives very little different of whatever type of screw you're going to utilize. I want to show this because um, I developed this model where we're actually publishing all this in JOT uh, next month and have done a lot of research 
with Columbia University and John Hopkins. This is a model I developed with two of my AO fellows. Um, and I just wanted to, uh, unfortunately, there's sound and we don't need the sound. Uh, let me see if I can cut it off um, because the sound is not useful there. Um, and play it. So you can build this at home. Um, and the beauty of this uh, is that it takes a few minutes to build. It's free. Um, and more importantly, um, you can practice a hundred times. This is what I give all, all my AO visitors who come at Denver Health for six weeks. I give them one of this model and then they go back to their centers in Argentina or wherever they come from and they start fixing confidently, uh, percutaneously pelvic and acetabular fracture. And it's a huge advantage because you can practice on this, the x-ray views, you can practice the technique, you can practice how to redirect your wires, uh, you can monitor your performance. And if you go to the website that I named earlier, theorthoacademy.com, um, I actually created, well, I had someone, a coder, create an algorithm where you can look at your performance using this model. So how long does it take you to get one screw in and any screws in the pelvis and how many breaches, uh, how often do you get out uh, through critical structures and you can monitor your progress in time, but also compare your performance to other surgeons who are using the same tool. Um, so it's a great little, um, re very realistic. In fact, the publication is coming out validated by other pelvic surgeons. Um, through this website, I, you know, I've done a lot of videos there and I'm not going to show them all because they're all accessible for free, but I'm showing you the technique to put an anti-grade or retrograde um, uh, column screw. Uh, so this is the, the technique for a retrograde anterior column screw, the views that you need, exactly you know, how to position and what are you looking for in each of those views. The beauty is that this takes into account the very short attention span of orthopedic trauma surgeon. My personal attention span is about two and a half minutes. So I have limited those videos to about two and a half minutes so that people who want to learn how to do that can, can learn. And uh, uh, so this was uh, the anterior column. Uh, there's one for retrograde. There's one for antegrade, um, posterior column, uh, LC2 screw. Um, and essentially all the five key iliosacral, transiliac, transiliac screw. So you can learn all of those uh, techniques. And I'm not going to show you the videos because they're all online. So um, these are for standard techniques, right? And then clamp placement and, and all of that good stuff you can see in papers. Everything is published. Um, I wanted to show you two uh, slightly different indications. This is a case I did actually 10 days ago. And I thought I would uh, show it to you because um, I, I like to do new things all the time. This is fairly recent, recently described because it's in the gray area of two different specialty, oncology and orthopedic trauma. But it's using the corridors that we just talked about to treat metastatic pelvic cancer. So this was a patient that came to me with um, widespread metastatic disease from lung uh, carcinoma. And he had met metastases, uh, lytic lesions in his uh, acetabulum, in his sacrum, everywhere in his pelvis. Uh, you can see the, the lesions uh, here. Uh, and on the MRI, he had enormous uh, voids and he was not able to weight bear. He also had femoral neck. You can see it on the right image here. Large femoral neck fracture with a Morel score of 11 uh, in the subtrochanteric areas. So I decided to, I, I randomly came across a JBGS paper from this month in January about techniques to, um, to treat this. This is not the paper, but it's, it's the same authors um, of doing AORIF. So ablation, thermoablation, uh, osteoplasty reinforcement and internal fixation. And essentially what this is, is you're, you're, you're placing your screws, all of your screws, um, through the pelvis on either uh, navigation or no navigation. I did not use navigation, but you can. Um, and you place your screws, you put your wires, you measure your wire your, for your screws, and you advance your screws to the start of the lesion. 
And then you do thermoblation, so heat in the lesion to kill the tumor cells. Put a balloon, it inflates to determine the lineage of the, the tumor. Then you inject cement, and then you fire your screws. Uh, it's a little uh, futzy because of the, all the various components, but you see here on the right image, the screws are all left out of the body. And this is every single possible corridor. Uh, so you can see that's the, um, the nail that I placed uh, with cement injection. That's an anti-grade anterior column. That's an LC2 screw with a transsacral transiliac. That's an anti-grade anterior column all the way to the lesion. That's a posterior column anti-grade. And all the wires are placed. We're measuring all the wires. We're putting all the screws up to, this is the probe. You can see the thermal probe. Now the, the, we're aiming for the tumor cells and injecting the cement um, right there in all the various lesions. Um, and then finally, uh, getting all the views and, uh, and, and getting these kind of views where the patient now is allowed to weight bear. Uh, we've consolidated his pelvis. And, and that, can be used for, um, that can be used for sacral fractures, right? Insufficiency fractures without using fancy fenestrated screws. Um, second and final uh, cool stuff uh, is, you know, the use of laparoscopy. That's, that's kind of advanced. Uh, you can't do this alone. Um, I used a, a urologist because they are the most um, versatile uh, at working around the, this area. But if you think about it, uh, the, the, the reason why we do stoppers for those fractures uh, um, uh, sometimes is just to place a clamp safely, right? We, we view, we do this extensile approach just to be able to put a clamp. And the thought in this case was a 38-year-old Jehovah Witness, uh, very obese, extremely obese, and I did not want to take the risk of not being able to transfuse her uh, should I require, um, uh, you know, transfusion. So I approached my urologist. He felt comfortable. And I just asked him, please guide me uh, uh, to avoid the obturator nerve so I can just put a ball spike pusher um, through, uh, the, um, through the quadrilateral plate. That's all I needed to do. And then fire screws. So we put a lot of traction. You see, we bolted her pelvis onto the operating room table. This is just using an external fixator to bolt and attach her to the table. We, use the, we have a pulley system on our ceiling. We use it all the time for lumbopelvic fixation, reduction of sacral U-shaped fractures. But in this case, I use it to, to put a lot of traction uh, onto her distal femurs. Look at the amount of reduction you get from just simple lateral traction. So the fracture was nearly reduced there. And what we just needed was a little guide uh, through small portals to push onto her quadrilateral surface uh, and then fire some percutaneous uh, column screws to capture that. So we did that from, uh, you know, from the anterior column and the posterior column. Um, as you can see here, the reduction is not perfect, but uh, for uh, that level of obesity, um, you know, I thought it was pretty adequate. And then, unfortunately, she also had a posterior wall fracture. Um, and again, we did this uh, percutaneously from the back with uh, x-ray control, capturing that wall fragment uh, and using cannulated instrument. You see the top left is a cannulated pig sticker uh, that allowed me to reduce that uh, wall fracture, push it in and compress it with some uh, lag screws um, to fix it through a very small uh, incision that avoided blood loss. Far from being perfect, I mean, I, I totally recognize that. I'm a pelvic surgeon and I'm not entirely proud of the quality of this reduction, but done all percutaneously with zero blood loss. Um, and this patient did uh, fairly adequately uh, considering her injuries. Uh, so, in summary, uh, it's important to know the bony anatomy. Uh, check out this model, build it and practice. You can practice a hundred times, um, get competent at getting the appropriate x-ray uh, for the appropriate corridor you're aiming. Uh, the key is knowing when your x-ray is adequate and when it isn't. That's the most important part of this technique. And try and practice to change the guide wire direction. This is the hardest part of doing percutaneous is my wire is not getting in the right trajectory. I'm about to go in the hip joint. How do I pull it out 
and change the direction, you got to practice this a million times. 10,000 hours will get you to where you need to go. Uh, thanks for listening, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. So, thank you, Cyril. It has been a wonderful experience to look at the way you have been developing the trauma thing into another things also with the technology developing to that level. So, but before that, uh, there is a question from the audience. How should I train my image operator to become expert in the navigation technique? Because now you are there in maximum of it. So, what do you think to train about? Maybe you have your own uh, people who are very well trained otherwise, but there needs to be a training for them. Most for, na for navigation, yes, definitely. So you usually always, e even in some cases which is uh, which are not really uh, perfect for navigation, you still use navigation to keep it, keep it, um, you know, doing and um, to keep it um, the practice going. Sorry. So that's why you, if you have your team and and very often in a university hospital, you have a huge rotation of teams, and very often you have young young nurses and the young uh, technicians who work with you. In this phase, we usually start doing navigation operations again and again, even if we, if it is standard situation and you have no complex dysmorphism of the pelvis, we always try to practice to get at least one case a week. So it's uh, if you use it always and you, the team is, is under practice, then it's uh, very easy to do it. And uh, actually, this is to repeat is, uh, I think, the most important um, part of it. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So it is basically the uh, kind of a revision of the procedure, which is done time and often is likely to be. And now, uh, the just uh, question of my mind when we understand in that in the pelvic morphology, the dis. Uh, Plastia dysplasia is very, very common for this sector. And we have got definitive points to differentiate it out. Is it still a way that because there are now new techniques that even in dysmorphic kind of a pelvis also, we can put the screws in a different corridors, little modified corridors. So uh, any, any kind of an experience which we have got for those kind of a, uh, techniques that in dysmorphism also we can still get or make out corridors. Maybe they are individualized to a particular patient uh, as such. Yeah, you're right. So very often you see that S2 corridor is very often present. It's always uh, present in almost many, as in many patients that we see. That's why S2 is uh, where I try to do it in every patient uh, which have fractures, sacral fractures. S1 is very often difficult. That's why you need to see your CT scans exactly. It probably measures your angles. Sometimes I measure exact angles. And, uh, and, the, uh, and yeah, you can use to place it. But to be sure, to be honest, I always, in that situation, I always use navigation system. But of course, if you understand the anatomy and uh, know the exact orientation, then you can place it without navigation if you experienced enough. Yeah. But in my situation, probably. S2 usually is, is very easy, um, it's possible, but it's one, in my opinion, sometimes if we have dysmorphic situation, I try to use navigation. Well, let, let me remind something, Ramesh, to the crowd that's listening to us so they, do, they don't embark in dangerous strategies here. The percutaneous is not always the best way. I, I just want to emphasize that, that you may uh, have very small corridors and, and therefore it is dangerous. And there's other techniques, right? If there's no corridors for the sacrum and you need to fix the posterior ring, uh, you can do multiple things. One of a very traditional way to do it is tension band plating. It's still pretty percutaneous, very small paracentral incisions, and you can fix any H, U-shape, sacral fractures, uh, SI disruption, vertical shear through small posterior approaches by putting... Um, a traditional LCDCP or recon plates at the back of the posterior ring. Okay, thank you. So the, that's an important part, and especially we deal because in our countries we tend to deal with a lot of late cases also, where even the reduction is also difficult. So we make that once the reduction is difficult, we are not likely to get a proper window or proper corridor also. So that becomes a procedure. Uh, Dr. Hassani, want to go for further questions?
Yeah, thank you. I really, <clears throat> it's quite interesting, something that we uh, didn't have in our uh, uh, literature and experience, the, the, the experience of uh, the Professor Maffrey with uh, laparoscopy. Uh, is this uh, only a case or uh, it's some kind of a uh, lot of cases that you have done through this uh, approach? And uh, uh, really, I'm interested on in because there are some papers on uh, Preperitoneal uh, laparoscopic or scopic approach without entering the abdominal abdominal uh, space. So that's my uh, to share the thoughts. If it is better to go through the abdomen, and if how is your experience with uh, uh, manipulating this fragment through the through the abdomen? That is quite quite interesting. Something that we don't we don't have it in in our experience and uh, yeah, it's to well, share for, with first, us the experience, yeah. First of all, this is rare. It's, it's frankly, it's not as fun as uh, doing a stopper. I mean, there is a yeah. fun, very fun and artistic component to the stopper that is, uh, that is removed by doing this. Uh, so anterior pelvic ring, um, lots of cases really well described with a laparoscope you know you put a very any any camera in the front you're going to be on the pubic symphysis i've done several cases doing that it's just more uh challenging for very little benefit right the the fan and steel is uh, six seven centimeters this is done through a one cent several one centimeter portals with uh, a futsy component of holding your plate centering it it takes longer so while it's totally doable and easy for the anterior ring, it adds no benefit. And I, I don't recommend this uh, technique for that. For the acetabulum, I think it's a little different. And what we need, and in fact, uh, some companies are starting to look into that, is, is better instrumentation. The clamps that we're using through whatever approach we fix acetabulum are clamps that are 80 years old, 70 years old, you know, 1960s. Um, they're inadequate. We still use the old, old-fashioned clamps. What we need is lower-profile clamps that use better technology that we can use through smaller incisions to perform those reductions. Uh, so all these are preperitoneal laparoscopies. They're they're not they're not inside the abdomen. They're all preperitoneal, and they're all done in the space essentially between the bladder and the obturator nerve through the space of retius, the same space we use for the stopper approach. And unfortunately, at the moment, the only instruments we can place through those portals are ball spike pushers. But imagine a clamp that would be able to go through a portal and out of the portal deploy, out of the portal, open some jaws to capture different kind of fracture configuration and, and that you could squeeze in there to place posterior column or anterior column screws. That would be a real innovation. And we're kind of looking into that with some companies, but um, I think, I think this is going to take a long time before we get away from open approaches and doing everything percutaneous, but I'm hopeful that we will get there in my time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. May I ask a question? Uh, so is there any, like I would say, an exact contraindication for percutaneous fixation for the double, uh, for example, it's a double of fractures? Any severe dislocation, what would say they would never do it percutaneously? What would you say? Because two weeks ago we had the pelvic uh, fracture course here with Adam Starr. He showed us technique for reposition, even dislocated fractures of the double, you know, everything fixed with a per, uh, uh, fixed everything percutaneously. So what would you say? What, what, um, when would you never do a percutaneous fixation? So I think the pelvis is very different from the acetabulum. So mm -hmm. for the pelvic ring, I think, um, you know, most of the time you can, most of the time, acute fractures, I'm not talking Ramesh's example. I, I know Ramesh's practice pretty well. I've, I've, I've been there many times and he's actually come to my house too. So I, I know what he does very well. His practice is different because uh, he takes care of a lot of, uh, he's the expert of many regions, a lot of neglected delayed. So that's a different ballgame. I'm talking purely acute fractures. Um, you can treat 
I would say 90% of them uh, percutaneously, right? That you maneuver with shant spins, reduce, pull, um, and then fix. Acetabulum, uh, if it's all about the dome. Um, if the dome is intact, uh, then you're good to do anything you want. You could fire, um, you know, column screws, get pieces back together. It's, it's kind of all about the roof arc angle, right? Um, so if there's too much comminution, obviously you wouldn't do this. The age group matters, a uh, 65-year-old with a two-millimeter gap and a comminuted fracture, I would lean towards percutaneous versus a 30-year-old with a two-millimeter gap where I would definitely go for open technique. So it's a combination. It's like saying, what is the indication to fix a posterior wall fracture? Well, it depends on the location and the size. Here, I guess it depends on the location and the age and the comminution of the patient. So it's that uh, trifecta effect uh, that makes me lean towards either more percutaneous technique or open for the acetabulum. Uh, just a related question, Cyril, I want to ask. Now we understand that when we, want, we were doing acetabulum surgery, we were many times not towards the articular side. We are taking an indirect expectation from the other cortices that the other side should be okay. Then people started doing arthrotomy to see whether the articular surface has been properly restored or not. So they were even using a safe surgical dislocation to look inside. And now there are people who are doing arthroscopy in addition. So once we are doing a percutaneous fixation for estabulum fractures, where we only depend upon the image as an evidence, while this image may be deceptive at some stages. So how sure we are while on the other side, they are going to opening the joint to assess whatever they are even doing. Here we will be depending upon the image only to say that we have been able to do a perfect job. So how, how do you take it? Well, I, I think, first of all, the image has improved with time. Now we have 3D fluoroscopy. We just acquired our first machine this week. We have done all this without any uh, 3D imaging before. We, we got everybody a post-operative CT scan. Every, every single of our patient gets a post-op CT uh, until now. Now with the 3D fluoroscopy, I think you have the ability to verify the quality of your reduction, even just one quick spin. Um, for percutaneous technique. But I think it it's, comes back to the type of fracture you're dealing with, Ramesh. For my indication for acetabular fixation is I'm mainly going to do columns and I'm mainly going to do columns that are usually out of the out of the roof arc angle, right? So I don't really care if there's a very tiny gap or step off because I'm, my indications are a little bit different than the, the classic indication. Um, if it's anything that needs perfect reduction, I will likely open those fractures and, and I want to see what I'm doing and put in clamps and fix them appropriately. Great. Thank you. So back to Roman. Um, probably a uh, uh, final question from my side. So regarding the um, in percutaneous transsacral fixation, would you do it differently in younger patients? So if the contralateral side is not injured, would you still would you still use a transsacral fixation or would you avoid it because the other side is not injured? Yeah, uh, good question. Uh, the answer is I don't know. I can tell you what I do, but I don't know if it's the right thing, like everything that I do, because I, I don't think there's good literature to guide anything that we do around the pelvis and acetabulum. Any robust enough literature to say, we are, we are definitely doing the right thing here. There's so many controversies. But if there is a corridor to put transsacral transiliac, I, my patient population is such that I need to be able to do a bomb-proof fixation because all my patients are going to do whatever they want to do independently of what I recommend. And therefore, if I can anchor threads into the contralateral pelvis, I will do that because it allows them to weight bear immediately. Plus, there's some literature uh, from four or five years ago that have looked into the contralateral unaffected hemipelvis penetrated by those transsacral transiliac screws with very little clinical consequences to patients. And, and, and the combination of those two factors has pushed me to be more aggressive. And if I can, I'll, I'll fix the contralateral pelvis. 
The other thing is very often, Roman, I think that's an important thing to say, but, uh, you know, we tend to focus as orthopedic trauma surgeons, when there's a pelvis LC2 fracture or compression fracture, our eyes are drawn to the compression side where we see the fracture. We have an 8% in, in our series, 8% missed LC3 fractures. You don't see it. You put your screw from the compression side and then you happen to penetrate the other side and suddenly the APC side that you don't see because it's reduced start to open up. So always have a very, very low threshold to think this is not just a compression. There's an APC on the other side. So what I do in those cases that I actually, you're in there and you realize it's opening. I pass, I use the long wire. I pass it through all the way through the skin and I will actually change from a compression side TSTI screw only to a kissing screws. I use the same wire and put a SI screw over that same wire to the midline and another one on the compression side so they meet right in the middle. Yeah, thank you very much for these comments. Very interesting. Ilir, do you have any questions? Yeah, I think uh, there, are, there are quite a lot of uh, things to debate here and to, to discuss. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have the navigation, but using the fluoroscopy can make sometimes uh, uh, miracles in the stubbler and pelvic surgery. We really routinely use these uh, iliosacral screws and we, we, do, we do all the percutaneous uh, uh, fixation, but sometimes uh, uh, being, uh, being aware that uh, with these dysmorphic uh, uh, situations, then we really, really need this, uh, the, the CT scanning and the CT visualization, 3D visualization intraoperatively. Uh, in, in general, I don't have nothing to, to add. I really uh, congratulate uh, uh, you uh, lectures about the perfect uh, lecturing and uh, uh, Dr. Murphy about the information that gave to us. And I really, really want to thank all the participants of, of uh, this uh, uh, webinar, the Secret Pioneer, that has started to become like a like a model of webinars in also in other other platforms. So I really want to, to thank you all all of uh, all of us. And if there is no more questions and uh, uh, from you, then I can close the, the this webinar because we are late on time also a little bit. Thank you for the invitation and the opportunity, guys. Thank you. Thank you all.